I wonder, I wonder what you would do if you had the power to dream at night any dream you wanted to dream. And you would, of course, be able to alter your time sense and slip, say, 75 years of subjective time into eight hours of sleep. You would, I suppose, start out by fulfilling all your wishes. You could design for yourself what would be the most ecstatic life. Love affairs, banquets, dancing girls, wonderful journeys, uh, gardens, music beyond belief. And then after a couple of months of this sort of thing at 75 years a night, you'll be getting a little uh, taste for something different. And uh, you would move over to an adventurous dimension where there were certain dangers involved and the thrill of dealing with dangers. And you could rescue princesses from dragons and go on dangerous journeys, make wonderful explosions and blow them up, eventually get into contest with enemies. And after you'd done that for some time, you'd think up a new wrinkle to forget that you were dreaming so that you would think it was all for real and to be anxious about it. And then, uh, because it'd be so great when you woke up, and then you'd say, well, like children who dare each other on things, how far out could you get? What could you take? What dimension of being lost, of abandonment of your power, what dimension of that could you stand? You could ask yourself this because you know you'd eventually wake up. And after you'd gone on doing this, you see, for some time, you would suddenly find yourself sitting around in this room with all your personal involvements, problems, etc., uh, talking with me. How do you know that that's not what you're doing? Could be. Because after all, what would you do if you were God? If you were what there is, the self. In the Upanishads, the basic texts of Hinduism, one of them starts out saying, in the beginning was the self. And looking around, it said, I am. And thus it is that everyone to this day, when asked who is there, says it is I. And thereafter gives whatever particular name he may have. For if you were God, and in this sense that you knew everything, and you were completely transparent to yourself through and through, you would be bored. Because if, looking at it from another way, we push technology to its furthest possible development, and we had, instead of a dial telephone on one's desk, a more complex system of buttons. And one touch, beep, would give you anything you wanted. Aladdin's lamp. You would eventually have to introduce a button labeled surprise. <laughs> because all perfectly known futures, as I pointed out, are past. They have happened, virtually. It is only the true future is a surprise. So if you were God, you would say to yourself, man, get lost. And it's strange that this idea is obscurely embedded in the Christian tradition, when in the epistle to the Philippians, St. Paul speaks of God the Son, the Logos, the Word of God, who is incarnate in Christ, 
and says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not equality with God a thing to be clung to, but made himself of no reputation, and humbled himself, and was found in fashion as a man, and became obedient to death. Same idea. Same idea as the idea of the dream. You get that very far out dream. Getting as extreme as you can get. And so this then is the basis of the Hindu view of the universe and of man. The Hindu looks upon the universe as a drama. The Westerner, of course, looks upon the universe as a construct, as something made. And it is not therefore insignificant that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. The Chinese looks upon the universe as an organism, as we shall subsequently see. But the dramatic idea is basic to Hinduism. Now you can speak about Hinduism on two levels at least. One I will call the metaphysical level and the other the mythological level. If you speak on the metaphysical level, you can speak only in negative language. You can say what the divine, the ultimate reality is not. If you speak on the mythological level, you may speak of what the divine is like. Because myth is not a falsehood, as one uses the word in a sophisticated way. A myth is an image, a concrete image, in terms of which man makes sense of the world. And thus the idea of God the Father, or God the Maker, is a myth, because it's an image. And Christian theologians distinguish equally between two kinds of theological language, which are respectively called cataphatic and apophatic. Apophatic language is negative, as when we say God is infinite and eternal. Cataphatic language is mythological, as when we say God the Father, God is love, and all the positive designations. We are not saying God is a cosmic male parent, but is analogous with the father. So with Hinduism. But what I'm going to speak to you in first of all is the mythological language of Hinduism. The idea of the universe as the big act. The universe is God playing hide and seek with himself. For God is thought of fundamentally to the Hindu as the self, the self, the cosmic I. And it is a basic proposition for the Hindu that only the Self, the Godhead, is real. There is nothing other than the Godhead. So that the appearance, uh, the feeling that there are other things than the Godhead is called Maya. Maya. We ordinarily translate that word illusion. But you must be careful about the word illusion. Illusion is related to the Latin ludere. And that means play. And this is why the analogy of the world is dramatic. It's a play. In the sense of a stage play. Now, when you go to the theater, you know what you're going to see is not for real. Because the proscenium arch tells you that. That everything that happens on the far side of that arch is only in play, not serious. But the actor, and you will hope that he will be good at it, is going to try and persuade you that it's for real. So that he will so move you 
that you are crying or sitting in anxiety upon the edge of your chair. And so the audience is almost persuaded to be taken in. Now what about if this would happen with the very best actor of all, the great actor? The audience would of course be completely taken in. But in this case, of course, the actor and the audience are the same, the self. The self has thus the capacity to abandon itself, to forget itself, to hide from itself, and thus to make the most completely convincing illusion. But in play, and so the activity, the creative activity of the Godhead in Hinduism is called Leela, which means play. Our word lilt is related to it, I think. But so also in the book of Proverbs, you will find a discourse being given by the divine wisdom. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. I think it's the 22nd chapter of Proverbs, in the course of which uh, the wisdom says that its delight was to rejoice, the King James Bible says, in the presence of God and with the sons of men. But the Hebrew translated rejoice says play. Rejoice is a sort of dignified Elizabethan, uh, but it says play. And St. Thomas, aware of this, said that the divine wisdom was above all to be compared with games, because games are played for their own sake and not for any sort of ulterior motive. So also music is a kind of non-purposive thing because you don't either play music to reach a destination nor do you dance to reach a particular place on the floor. It is the doing of it itself that is important because after all if the object of music were to gain a certain destination, those orchestras that played fastest would be considered the best. So the, the, the idea is that, the, that dancing and music, more than other arts, represent the nature of this world. That it is playful, that it is sport. That it may be sincere, but is definitely not serious. And as G.K. Chesterton well put it once, the angels fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> How much more so the Lord of the angels. So if a beautiful lady should say to me, I love you, and I were to reply, are you serious or are you just playing with me? That would be quite the wrong response, because I hope she's not serious and that she will play with me. I should say, are you sincere or are you just toying with me? Because you see, the word play has many different senses. A person who is playing the organ in church is certainly not doing something trivial. When you go to see a play called Hamlet, you're not seeing something trivial. When the concert artist plays Mozart, he is certainly entertaining you, but it's not a trivial entertainment. But on the other hand, we would use play in a, a, a quite a different sense when we mean just fooling around, doing it for kicks. So it is fundamental, as a matter of fact, to both the Hindu and the Christian traditions that the universe is the play of God. But the Christian thinks of it in the terms of a construction play, like building with blocks. And the Hindu thinks of it as dramatic play, of the actual participation of the Godhead in the creation, so that every being whatsoever is God in disguise. Hinduism speaks of the Godhead as, you uses the word Brahma. This is a neuter form in Sanskrit from the root bri, which means to grow, to expand, to swell. 
the neuter form Brahman uh, does not have quite the connotation then, you see, of kingship that we will find attached to the Western idea of God, but is also referred to as Atman. And this word we translate ordinarily the self. So you can have the para param you put the m in to connect the particle paramatman which means para the supreme self uh, or sometimes just the atman alone and that means the self in you but the fundamental principle of indian philosophy is atman is brahman yourself is the supreme self or it is expressed in also in the formula tat tvam asi colloquially translated you're it or tat that tuam latin tuam you asi are you you are that that thou art uh, tat of course is uh, the first word uttered by a baby da. And fathers flatter themselves that it's saying dada. It's not. It's saying that. Da, 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 da. And so it's pointing to thatness in everything. It's very important to see this. Because um, everything is just that. Uh, I can say it in a negative way, which you won't appreciate at first, perhaps. Everything is meaningless. Only words have meaning. Because they point to something other than themselves. The sound water is undrinkable. <laughs> but it points to the drinkable reality. When you say, though, what is that pointing at the water? And somebody says water, he's not being correct because what you're pointing at is not the noise water. So it's not water. It's that. Duh. And water's a kind of jazz. And uh, it's, it's just doing that. And uh, you can get to see too, people are a kind of jazz. They talk and communicate with each other, but what does that mean? Well, they get together and they make more people and they do this and they do that and they eat and they go on doing this jazz, but it's just jazz. And you begin to see as you do that, everything's like music, you see. It's all these complicated vibrations. In all kinds of ways. That's that. Or thatness. Tathata, also called in Sanskrit. So anyway, this is the fundamental notion that you uh, are really what there is, the works. Only you're playing hide and seek with yourself. And on a stupendous scale, Hindus measure time in units which in Sanskrit are called kalpa. And a kalpa is a period of 4,320,000 years. And uh, there are two kinds of kalpa. One is called manvantara. And the other is called pralaya. Manvantara is the kalpa in which the universe is manifested, in other words, in which God puts on his big act, and pralaya is the succeeding kalpa in which the universe is unmanifested, and the Godhead does not dream, but is awake to its own nature. These are called, respectively, the days and the nights of the Brahman, and this goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. The days and nights adding up into 
years and centuries and eons. They speak of Kro, there's a Sanskrit measure, Kro, C-R-O-R-E. Uh, a sort of a word that really I think means umpteen. Uh, Kro's of Kalpas. And uh, this is the in-breathing and the out-breathing. Uh, there's the word Hangsa. In this word in Sanskrit, Hangsa means a swan or a big water bird, like a gander. There's a myth that the, there is in the beginning the divine bird which lays the egg of the world. And the egg splits and the upper is the heavens and the lower is the earth. So when the worlds are manifested, the Lord breathing out says, Hung! And when the wells are withdrawn, the breath comes back. But if you say hung sa hung sa hung sa hung, it becomes sa hung sa hung sa ha hung. That means sa means that the truth. Ha hung, I am. I am that. <laughs> it's like uh, imagine. Uh, when we get uh, to the final moment in which the world is blown up. You know, imagine the countdown. This is the end. Somebody's pushed the button. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. here into this kind of thinking and you're hearing the ocean of the universe going and that's your breathing too it's all one rhythm so it may be that every star was once a planet populated by intelligent people who found out about the fundamental energy of the universe and blew themselves up and as they blew up they scattered all kinds of stuff out which became little planets in a long time life started all over again because the Hindu theory is very odd every Kalpa in the Manvantara period where there's a manifested world is divided into four subdivisions of time each one of which is called a Yuga that means roughly an epoch or an era and the, there are four Yugas they're named after the different throws in the Indian game of dice. There are four such throws, and the first is called Krita. That means, Kri means to do, as when we say something is done, truly done. It's the perfect throw of four. The second is called Treta, which is the throw of three. The next is called Dvapara which is the throw of two. And the final one is called Kali, which means the worst throw, which is the throw of one. Now, each of these periods of the Kalpa are of different lengths. Krita is the longest, and Kali is the shortest, and so ranged. So that when the world is first manifested, as in those dreams that I were mentioning to you, the world is in a golden age to begin with. It's perfect. And that is the longest period of time. Then when we get a little bit more adventurous, you see, uh, the treta means that in this era, a k 
kind of disharmonious element enters into things. It's like a three-legged chair isn't so secure as a four-legged chair. It's just a bit inclined to tip. And as it were, as a fly in the ointment, a snake in the garden. Then comes Dvapara, in which the forces of good and evil are equally balanced. And finally, Kali, which is the shortest period, where the forces of evil are triumphant, and the world is destroyed at the end of it. For then the Godhead appears in the form of Shiva, who represents the destructive aspect of the divine energy. And uh, whereas Brahma is the creative, Vishnu the preserver, Shiva the destroyer. But Shiva is always the destroyer in the sense of the liberator the guy who breaks up the ruts. And he comes on with a blue body and ten arms and a necklace of skulls. Indian gods have many arms because they are cosmic centipedes. They do all things without having to think about it. Like the centipede doesn't have to think about how to manipulate its legs. Like you don't have to think how to grow your hair. And as Shiva dances what is called the Tandava, which is the dance of destruction at the end of the cycle, at the end of the Kalpa, you will see that his hands contain clubs and knives and bells, but one hand is like that. And that gesture means, don't be afraid, it's a big act. It is all, as it were, the outflowing of your own consciousness, of your own mind. Now then, the Hindu life is related to this cosmology. And the objective of life is, of course, in the end, to wake up from the dream when you've had enough. And so the dreaming process is called sometimes samsara. Samsara um, is the round, the rat race. And uh, samsara is divided into six divisions. I better draw a map, I think. This is common, you see, cosmology to both the Hindus and the Buddhists. This is the world of the Deva. And through, this is the same root from which we get both divine and devil. The Deva means angel. The highest and most successful beings in the universe. And so opposite, this is the world of Narak. Naraka, who are the most unsuccessful. These are the purgatorial worlds of extreme suffering. This is the world of Ashura. They are also angels, but they're angry angels, representing the, the wrath potential of energy. This is the world of animals. This is the world of Preta, for which we have no English equivalent. They are hungry or frustrated spirits who have enormous stomachs but mouths only the size of needles. Vast appetite and no means of fulfillment. And this is the Manu world, that is to say, the world of man. You don't have to take this literally. Uh, you could say, when you are extremely happy or ecstatic, you are here. When you are miserable, you are here. When you are dumb, you are here. When you are mad, you are here. When you are frustrated, you are here. But when you are more or less your normal, rational self, you are here. <laughs> now, so, uh, the, all life through the period of the Kalpas goes grinding around this wheel. And if you go up, and you succeed, and you get to the top, you have to come down. 
they don't see success, in other words, in the world as a method of liberation because it implies failure. So uh, the idea of liberation, which is called moksha, is the ideal of Hindu life. Wake up, it's a dream. And in time, there is no hope in time. Everything is going to get worse in time. Because as you know, it does. We all fall apart in the end. Everything falls apart. Institutions, buildings, nations, it all crumbles. And people say, well, that's an awfully pessimistic philosophy. Well, is it? I would rather say that the people who have hope in the future are the miserable people. Because they're like donkeys chasing carrots that are dangled before their noses from sticks attached to their collars. And they pursue and they pursue in vain, always hoping that tomorrow will be the great thing and therefore incapable of enjoying themselves today. People who live for the future never get there because when their plans mature, they are not there to enjoy them. They're the sort of people who spend their lives saving for their old age, and trying to teach their children to do the same thing, so that when they retire at 65, you know, they have false teeth and wrinkles and prostate trouble and all that sort of thing. Uh, where were you going? What did you think it was all about? Furthermore, the fact that life is transient is part of its liveliness. The poets, in speaking of the transience of the world, always utter their best poetry. You know, our revels now are ended. And these, our actors, as I foretold you, are all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great earth itself, I, all which it inherits, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a wreck behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. And said so well, it doesn't seem so bad after all, does it? <laughs> uh, you see, there's always in, in the, the poetry of Evanescence a kind of funny nostalgia. Moralists will say, those lovely lips which you so delight to kiss today will in a few years rot and disclose the grinning teeth of a skull. So what? The skull says, lying in the grass, chattering finch and waterfly are not merrier than I. Here among the flowers I lie, laughing everlastingly. No, I may not tell the best. Surely, friends, I could have guessed. Death was but the good king's jest. It was hid so carefully. And monks used to keep skulls on their desks. And people nowadays think that was very morbid. I went and visited a chapel in the Via Veneto in Rome where there's a crypt where all the altar furnishings are made out of human bones. The altars are piles of skulls. There are rib bones arranged across the ceiling like floral patterns with vertebrae representing flowers. And they're all dead capuchin monks. And there's a funny little monk collecting the admissions up at the top. And he has one of the funniest grins on his face I've seen in a long time. I said to him, you know, on the day of resurrection, there's going to be an awful lot of scuttling up this narrow staircase. <laughs> People trying to reassemble their bones. <laughs> oh, dear father, isn't that my fifth metatarsal? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the whole idea, you see, is that everything's falling apart. 
precipice, so don't try and stop it. When you're falling off a precipice, it doesn't do you any good to hang on to hang on to a rock that's falling with you. See? Well, everything is doing that. And so again, this is another case of our completely wasting our energy in trying to prevent the world from falling apart. Don't do it. And then you'll be able to do something. Interesting. With the free energy. So that's moksha. Because when the Hindu says everything is unreal, the Westerner reacts and says, no, no, you can't treat life as a dream. It's serious. It's real. It's for real. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, how, how real do you want it to be? This is, in other words, everything, insofar as it's falling apart, everything is changing, it is like smoke. And we all feel that smoke has a lesser degree of reality than wood. It's, a, it's an image of the evanescent, of the ghostly. So there's this idea, the whole world is this mirage. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's only bad if you cling to it, if you try to lean on it. But if you don't lean on it, it's a grand illusion. So the word maya means not only illusion, but it means art, it means magic, and it means creative power. So this is the big act. And uh, it's perhaps easier to feel the world in that way in a tropical country where death is very common and where you just watch things dissolve before your eyes and yet burst out and grow again. The whole world is changing. Maybe easier to think that way than in our environment. Although when you're out in California, um, the human landscape changes so fast that uh, the, no, no town is the same for two years. Any mailing list that you have uh, changes one third addresses per annum. Nothing stays put. The hills are shadows and they flow from form to form and nothing stands. Now, uh, this you see is not a pessimistic attitude therefore at all. To be able to realize that this world is simply a dream. A dancing play of smoke. Fascinating, yes, but don't lean on it. Life is a bridge, says one of the Hindu sayings. Pass over it, but build no house upon it. And so immediately you see that. This is responsible for the enormous gaiety of certain Hindu sages. This is a thing that often puzzles Westerners. Uh, the element of they expected anybody who's an ascetic or a sage or something to be rather miserable with a glum face but on the contrary you take this character who's going around these days uh, Mahashi Mahesh he's always laughing because he sits through it he looks on every side and there is the face of the beloved of the divinity in everybody in every direction in everything playing at being you you can look down into a person's eyes, way, way in, and you see the self, the eternal divine. What is so funny when it puts on an expression saying, what, me? <laughs> and the, the guru, the teacher. When people go to a guru, they get all sorts of funny ideas. They think, oh, he's looking right through me. He sees me knows how awful I am, reads my most secret thoughts, because he has a funny look in his face. He isn't even interested in your secret thoughts. He is looking straight at the Godhead in you, with a funny expression on his face, which is saying, why are you trying to kid me? <laughs> Come off it, Shiva, I know who you are. <laughs> But um, and therefore, you see, his, his role is to gently uh, humor you into waking up as to your true nature. Now, of course, as I intimated earlier, the Hindu is therefore saying everybody is God. 
And this is why when a Hindu greets you, he does this. That is the, the act of puja or worship to the Godhead in you. And our theologians get rather worried about that because, you see, the two conceptions of God are different. Our conception is of the boss man, the king. Theirs is of the cosmic centipede with the many arms, who does not have to think how to make the world, or rather to act the world. That would be an insufferable nuisance. You may think it rather wonderful when St. Thomas tries to explain that God is fully aware of everything that happens and in every detail is willing each single vibration of any mosquito's wing. But when you really begin to think about it, that approaches intellectual elephantiasis. God heard the embattled nation shout, God strafe England and God save the king. God this, God that and God the other thing. Good God said God, I've got my work cut out. <laughs> so therefore, when uh, somebody in India suddenly announces that he's God, nobody accuses him of blasphemy or of being insane. They say simply, congratulations, at last you found out. <laughs> and uh, they don't immediately request a miracle. As you see, if we get across someone who says, I'm God or I'm Jesus Christ, they say what they said to Jesus Christ in the first place. Command that this bread, these stones be made bread. And you know, he used to wangle out of it by saying, a wicked and deceitful generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given. The Hindu would say, but there is no point in changing it. It's going the way I want it to anyhow. Only really and truly, uh, there is not this idea of God the technician, but rather, uh, the power of, of omnipotence is not to be able to do anything, but to be doing all things, whatever it is that's going on. And spontaneously, without having to think about it, which is very clumsy. Now then, uh, I must say something about how then this relates to the life of the Hindu. The Hindu divide life into certain stages, what are called the ashramas. The first is called brahmacharya, the second grihastha, and the third vanaprastha. Brahmacharya means uh, the stage of the student the apprenticeship. Grihastha, the stage of the householder. And Varnaprastha, the stage of the forest dweller. This is related to cultural history of early India. Before we have agrarian communities, we have a hunting culture which is on the move. In a hunting culture, Every male knows the whole culture. There is no division of labor. And the holy man of the hunting culture is, of course, called a shaman. A shaman is a, a realized man, a man who knows the inner secret seen through the game and he finds it by going away alone into the forest and cutting himself off from the tribe that is to say from social conditioning and he goes maybe for a long period into the forest and comes back he's found out who he is and he sure isn't who he was told he was but as hunting cultures settle into agrarian patterns of life what do they do? They build a village. 
And around the village they set up a stockade, which is known as the Pale. And the village is always, of course, standing at crossroads. And there you get in an agrarian society a division of labor. And the division of labor comprises four. Uh, in medieval Europe, we call them lords spiritual, lords temporal, commons, and serfs. In India, they are Brahmin, Kshatriya, that means fighters, Vaishya, merchants, traders, Shudra, laborers. So you've got the priests, the warriors, the merchants, and the laborers. Division of labor. The four sections of town. So the four basic castes. So when you are born, you are born into a caste. And uh, your duty as a grihasta or householder is to fulfill your caste function and to bring up a family. When you've done that, you go back to the forest. Back to the hunting culture. And you drop your role. And you become nobody. A shaman again. So a Hindu calls one who does this a shramana, which is of course the same word as shaman. And the Chinese call him a xia man. <laughs> A shaman. <laughs> uh, a shaman is an immortal. Why immortal? Because it's only the role that's mortal. The big front, the persona. The one who you really are, the common man, that is to say the man who is common to us all, which you could call the son of man, that's the real self. That's the guy who's putting on the big act. And, of course, he has no name. Nobody can put the finger on him. Because you can't touch the tip of the finger with the tip of the finger. So, that means in practice, then, that when you hand over your vocation in life, which is called your svadharma, that means sva, that's the same as the Latin suus, one's own. Dharma means function your own function, or we would call your vocation, when you've completed it, you drop out and become nobody. Because you're going to find out now who you really are. You're no longer uh, Mr. Mukhopadhyaya, who is a cloth salesman. You drop that name, and you take on one of the names of God. Swami Brahmananda, Swami Bliss of Brahma. And you're, uh, you may go quite naked, like the Shivite uh, holy man. No clothes. And they just pssst, uh, go out and wander and don't make any provision for anything. They in, literally uh, take no thought for the morrow, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or wherewithal they shall be clothed. But you see people respect them. They say, yeah, we've got to have those people up there because they are doing what human being is ultimately supposed to do and we shall do it in our turn. And so uh, give them some food. Now, naturally, caste, holy men, and all that kind of thing can be exploited. Anything can be exploited and abused. But we can look at it all and say, what a mess. Why don't you do something for yourself? Why don't you kill the sacred cows that eat? Why don't you uh, clean up? Why do you permit all this disease? Just try and see something from another point of view for a change. I'm not saying that we should do what the Hindus do, but just look at it from another point of view. And they would smile at us and say, 
You really think it's as real as all that? Have you never experienced what's on the inside of this game? The trouble with you Westerners is you've never experienced this. You never got down to the root of reality. You don't know that state of consciousness. So you're frantically trying to patch everything up and pin it all together and screw the universe up so that it's fixed. And you can never do it. All you do is going wildly rushing around and creating trouble. Of course, Western educated Hindus think the same way. They are now for rushing around and uh, patching India up. And what's going to happen is they're going to arm all the millions of people in India. And they're going to create a lot of trouble in Asia one of these days when they become a powerful society. When you read Milton's Paradise Lost, long before Lucifer decided to rebel, the whole of heaven was armed. And he describes the legions of angels with their escutcheons and gonfalons and uh, military deportment. Who was looking for trouble? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Lucifer was a good guy back then, you see? The bearer of light. So the Hindu looks at our Christianity, though, and sort of thinks, my goodness. Here is the, the, the eternal self. But in the idea of Christianity, the, the, go the, the Godhead is having a real far-out one. Because not only is he incarnating himself, say, as some wretched beggar, but he's incarnated himself as a Christian soul who believes that in this one short life he will decide his eternal destiny. And the possibilities of making a mistake are far greater than of being a lousy beggar. The possibility involved in the Christian gamble is to fry in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Even the Avicii hell at the bottom of the Naraka only goes on for about one kalpa. But the everlasting damnation, what an idea. So the Hindu says, bravo, you know. Uh, God has really done a dare on himself this time to be a Christian soul.